Well, good evening everyone. It's good to be back among you again and this time I've been given the opportunity to preach the wonderful gospel of Christ. So before we consider that, can we just bow again and ask the Lord to give us understanding. Our Father, we are but men and women, boys and girls, Lord of our souls, we have no righteousness. Therefore, Lord, we need your grace. We need your mercy. We need your gift. And we pray, Lord, that tonight you might indeed be gracious to us. Show us more of your grace and mercy and the wonder of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the year 1523, in Germany, a Roman Catholic priest named Martin Luther, when reading his Bible, discovered an old truth that not only changed his life, but also change the course of world history. You see, Martin Luther, like most professing Christians of his day, had the idea that it was on the basis of his own righteousness, his own good deeds, that God would ultimately accept him because that's what he'd been taught. However, Martin knew very well down inside that he really had no righteousness of his own at all. He knew he was a sinner and he had no idea how on earth he could ever become righteous. How then could God possibly save a man like him? On judgment day when he stood before God, he knew that he was guilty. He knew that he would be condemned. Even though he'd, he'd been a priest for many years, he never understood the gospel of Christ. So he was in great turmoil of heart and mind for months and months for the Holy Spirit was already beginning to work in his heart causing him to think about these things causing him to see that he was in fact guilty before God and he didn't have any righteousness of his own. So Martin tried all sorts of things. Some of you may have read his story and you may know that at one stage he went to Rome and he found this this, this great big cathedral and he felt that if, if he walked up the cathedral steps, these stone steps on his knees, that somehow God would be appeased and, and, and God would accept him. And even after he did that, he realised that no, this wasn't going to work. How could that possibly change? How could that ever give him any righteousness? And so he continued to be in turmoil of heart and mind for many, many months. Then one day he was reading his Bible from Romans chapter 1 and some words struck him, struck him like a thunderbolt. He read these words before but somehow he never really understood what they meant. But now God in his mercy by his spirit was opening his eyes to a truth that he'd never ever seen before. And that truth we find in Romans 1 verse 17. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Well, we thought, it must be possible for someone at least to be just, otherwise that verse wouldn't be true. If it's talking about the just shall live, who are the just? How can I be just? How can I be righteous before God? So he's encouraged by those words. And so he decided he'd better go to his Bible and read it a bit more and he read the verses around. And I want you to follow if you have your Bible in Romans chapter 1 verse 16 and 17 and I'll just read these words so we get the whole thing together. The Apostle Paul is writing these words to the believers in the church in Rome and he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, 
For in it, that is in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Immediately Martin realised that it was not his own righteousness which was the basis of his acceptance before God but it was the righteousness that God himself would give him. That was a revelation to him. He would never understood it that way. He could see now that it wasn't to do with all the good works and all the things he'd done at all but it was something which God would give him as a gift freely if he came and trusted in, in the Lord Jesus Christ and believed on him. The result was that Martin Luther was converted. He became a true Christian and he began to preach this wonderful gospel, this good news. However, amazingly, he was threatened by the Roman Catholic Church at that time, even threatened with excommunication and even death. However, this didn't stop him. Soon other people began to be convinced of the same truth and they too were converted and a fire began which could not be put out. And so began the great Protestant Reformation which went on to change the course of world history. And it all started with this little phrase, the just shall live by faith. Wonderful, wonderful truth. Some people have translated another way, the just by faith shall live, or by faith the just shall live. Now this particular truth that Martin Luther had rediscovered, which had been hidden for centuries it seems, was now revealed to him and to others in the Gospel of Christ. This truth which had been misunderstood for so long now became clear to many people. And people began to understand what it meant to become a believer, what it meant to go on and live by faith as well. Now it's possible that there are some here even this evening who are among that group, like Martin Luther. You've heard many of these things, you've read them before, but somehow you haven't quite understood them. And so our desire is tonight as we explain these words that God will do for you what he did for Martin Luther and open your eyes and give you understanding that you might come to genuine faith as well. So I'm going to suggest that we read those two verses again that we read a moment ago in Romans chapter 1 verse 16 and 17 and uh, then we'll continue on. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith. Now the first thing I want you to notice here this evening is what it is that is revealed in the gospel. Notice what it says in verse 17 again. In it, that is in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Say it again. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. So the gospel or the good news concerns the revealing of the righteousness of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it's interesting to observe that almost every man-made religion or every devil-made religion if you want in the world has as its, base, as its basis the idea that somehow God will accept us because of our good deeds or our works or our righteousness. That seems fairly common throughout the world. I'll give you some examples. Liberal Christianity, which I don't believe is true Christianity at all, 
is often all about humanitarian activities. It's all about justice and peace and all those sorts of things which are nice in themselves. But these people do not understand the gospel. It's all about works. It's all horizontal. It's what we have to do. Roman Catholicism is a religion of works. That's what Martin Luther was taught. That's what he came out of. Many of the sects are religions of works. The JWs, for instance, just one to mention. Modern Judaism, for instance, is also a religion of works. It's a means of keeping the law. And that's what we read about before in the scriptures. People think that by keeping the law, God will accept them. Their righteousness will somehow mean, be a means of God accepting them on the last day. But another one, of course, is Islam. Islam is a works-based religion. Let me give you an example. Many of you will know that last month was Ramadan in the Islamic world. Muslims believe that Allah gave Ramadan as a gift to his servants to help them, notice, earn their salvation. Burning away their sins, drawing near to him and teaching them self-discipline and sympathy to Paul. But you see, their whole idea is that they, by their deeds, are earning their salvation. Now, of course, that can include all sorts of terrible things, can't it, as we know. They think that by blowing up a whole lot of people, somehow they earn salvation. Beyond me. As I said, these things are devil's ideas, not from God. But, of course, we know that salvation is not by works, but it is a gift from God. You see, these people that we've just been referring to know nothing at all about the righteousness of God which was revealed in the Gospel. They don't know. They're ignorant of it. But that is what the Gospel is about. Now, I think it's true to say that all works-based religions in the world are actually a devil's lie to trap as many people as he can and he's very successful. However, the gospel is the very opposite to that. For the only righteousness that God will accept is the righteousness that he himself gives to those who have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the redemption that he has accomplished. I'll say that again. The only righteousness that God will accept is the righteousness that he himself gives to those who have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the redemption that he has accomplished. Now, if you still have your Bibles open, I want you to turn over a couple of pages to Romans chapter 3. I know we read this before, but I just want to read two verses again because these two verses crystallise what we're talking about here very well. Romans 3 and verse 21 and 22. But now, this is now in the New Testament era, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For well, there is no difference. Clear, isn't it? The gospel is about the righteousness of God. Now we need to stop a moment and ask ourselves a question. What is this righteousness of God? What is this righteousness that God actually gives people as a gift? You may remember that we read a moment ago that this righteousness of God was not really clearly apparent in the old times because it only became apparent when Christ came to earth. Therefore, this righteousness of God has to do with the righteous life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Christ is God himself in human flesh or was God in human flesh when he came to earth, this righteousness of Jesus Christ is in fact the righteousness of God for he is and was God. You see, it is Christ's righteousness which ultimately is put to the account of believers and it is on that basis that God accepts them. 
So the good news of the gospel is about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did while on earth and some theologians put it this way. Some of you may not have heard this before. The gospel is about Christ's doing and his dying. It's about Christ's doing and his dying. His doing is his righteous deeds and his dying, of course, is the means whereby he took away sin. These two things need to be seen together. So the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's something else, secondly, that we need to be clear about in the verse that we quoted at the start, the just shall live by faith. We need to ask, what does it mean when it talks about the just? Who are the just? As Martin Luther realised on that day in 523, it must be possible for someone to be just, otherwise it wouldn't be true to say the just shall live by faith. Therefore it must be possible for people to be just before God and live. And that was a wonderful revelation to Martin. But then really what does it mean to be just? Well it simply means to be declared not guilty or righteous. Let me give an example. Imagine if you were accused of something, some offence, and you were taken to court and when all the evidence was put out before the court and the judge could see that there was really no basis for the accusation against you, he would have no choice but to declare you not guilty. Therefore, you would be considered just, justified, not guilty. That's the idea. However, with the situation between man and God, it's different. It's quite different to that. You see, the point is that we are all guilty. So the question then comes in, if we are all guilty and we are all sinners, and we read that before, uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, there's no doubt about that. How then can God declare a person who is guilty not guilty? Surely that would be unjust. How could God do that? That's the dilemma here. So what's the answer? Well, the answer is this, that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, took the sin and guilt of all those who would trust in him. In other words, their sin, our sin, those who would trust in Christ, was imputed or put to Christ's account. It was laid on him. It says, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord Jesus Christ became the great sin bearer. The Bible says he became sin for us. And so when he died on the cross, he paid the penalty, the death penalty, for the sin of those people. Therefore, even though every one of these people were guilty and are guilty sinners, because of what Christ has done on, the beha- on their behalf by taking their sin away, God now sees those people as not guilty. For their sin has been taken from them and laid on the Lord Jesus Christ. It was done 2,000 years ago. Amazing, isn't it? That God can see so far ahead and yet he can, he can see us and our sin and then amazingly he's able to take our sin way back then even though we hadn't been born yet and he put all that sin on the Lord Jesus Christ and Lord Jesus Christ took the punishment for our sin. And therefore that sin was dealt with judicially by God and therefore on that basis he, was, he is able to declare those who have faith in him not guilty for their sin has been taken away. However, there's a little more to it than even that. Because these people have trusted Christ to save them, God does something else. Because at the moment, you see, they are, have their sins just forgiven But remember what God requires is that these people be righteous. Where's the righteousness coming from? We don't have any. 
God graciously gives us or puts to our account the righteousness of Christ. And God sees us as his sons and daughters in Christ and we are accepted like his son with the righteousness of Christ imputed or put to our account. And therefore God sees those who come to faith in Christ and have been declared righteous as his people, righteous forever and ever. Amazing. The just, the righteous shall live by faith. Why do we live? Because of what Christ has done. He has, by his death, taken our sin and then marvellously God imputes or puts to our account that righteousness even of the Lord Jesus Christ. On that basis, God accepts us now and will accept us on judgment day. That's why Paul says in Romans 1, 15 to 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So in summary then, we now know a little about the gospel that righteousness which has been revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. We also know who the just are and that Christ's righteousness is put to their account simply because they have been redeemed by Christ and they have come to put their faith in him. Their sin has been put to Christ's account and Christ's righteousness has been transferred and put to their account. On this basis, God considers these people just and righteous before him and therefore eternally acceptable and therefore they have eternal life. This then is the gospel of Christ, the glorious gospel of the righteousness which God gives to those who believe. And it all comes because of God's grace because of what God alone does. Salvation is of the Lord. Praise his name it is. For if it wasn't, we would have no hope at all or none of us have any righteousness of our own. But thirdly and finally now, we need to be clear of one more thing. For remember our verse says, the just shall live by faith. Now here's where there's much confusion in the world today. Confusion about what is faith? What faith? Faith in what? Faith in who? Now I'm going to give you some suggestions about what it isn't before we talk about what it is. All right, let's clear the decks because there are a lot of confusion as I said out there. First thing, it's not faith in faith. Now it's common today for some people to have this idea that they just have faith in faith or they have faith that something's going to happen or it will happen and, and it's just very loose sort of an idea. Um, it doesn't seem to matter what people have faith in so long as they have faith. It's sort of faith that all things will work out in the end. It's a kind of faith in faith. But of course, this has nothing to do with this faith in the Bible. This is just people's imagination. So it's not, this is not the faith spoken of in the Bible at all. But there's other people who think that this faith is faith in yourself. Now this is just so common today. Just so common. Faith in yourself. Look within. There's the answer. That's the common idea. Now I wonder how many people here listen to the radio very much and... Uh, know some of the songs around. Um, I, I listen to the ABC now and again and I, I hear this song when I'm having a shave in the morning or something. I want you to put your hand up if you know this song. Search for the hero inside yourself. How many people have heard it? A couple of nods. Mm, not many ABC watchers, listeners, eh? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to read the words of the song to you because it's very well known in most circles. Not up here, apparently you don't get it up here. <laughs> Okay, 
it's interesting. This, this is this, this famous song. Sometimes the river flows but nothing breathes. A train arrives but never leaves. It's a shame. Oh, life's like love that walks out the door of being rich or being poor. Such a shame. But it's then, then that faith arrives to make you feel at least alive. And that's why you should keep on aiming high. Just seek yourself and you will shine. You've got to search for the hero inside yourself. Search for the secrets you hide. Search for the hero inside yourself until you find the key to your life. The idea is that you can do it. It's all in here. That's the common idea. Faith in yourself. Now, many of you, I'll ask you, how many people have heard of the book Norman Vincent Peale wrote The Power of Positive Thinking? A few more. Wow, that's good. Okay. Quite a while ago, but it's very, very well known. The idea is that you have the power within yourself. Just think hard enough about it and you'll do it. If you listen carefully, you'll hear this everywhere. You hear the Olympic people before they go to the Olympics. You know, if I just think about it enough and tell myself I'm going to do it, I'll do it. The power within, you see. This is the secret, they think. Now, amazingly, other people have picked it up and they put it, a Christian sort of a slant to it. And, and they talk about the purpose in life. And if we can only find our purpose in life, then we'll be right. But once again, it's, it's looking within. It's me and me. I'm the centre of everything. Faith in myself, that's what will get me through. Well, that's not the faith it's talking about here. But that's the common faith we see spoken about in the world today. The faith people speak about in the world is actually the very opposite to the faith spoken in this verse. For in the gospel of Christ, we don't look within. We look out. We look to the Lord Jesus Christ to save us. We don't look in to save ourselves. We look away from ourselves. That's the difference. Entirely the opposite to what we've been told. You see, the devil wants you to look in. But God wants you to look out. He wants you to look to him for there is no salvation in any other but him. One more. Saving faith is not faith in your own goodness. Now you will know, I'm sure, that many people have this idea. I call it the scales method. You know the old scales where you had a little pivot section, a little base and a pivot, and the thing balanced on there and you had a section under here and a section under there and you could put a weight there and put the other things in there and see how it weighed. If you have a look at the, uh, the front of the law courts, you'll see the, the same picture of the person holding those scales. Well, a lot of people have the idea that on judgment day, God's going to have a set of scales. And on one side you put your good deeds and the other side you put your bad ones. And if the bad ones may weigh more than the good ones, whoop! He's out. But if the good ones weigh more than the bad ones, he's in. Now that's common. Most people you ask in the street, they will say, yes, in the end I'll make it. Because after all, I haven't murdered anybody, I haven't done all these bad things. God will accept me in the end. So what are they saying? I'm righteous. But God says, there is none righteous. No, not even one. In fact, he says, our righteousness is just like filthy rags to him. And so there will be no scales in heaven. You know why? God's standard of righteousness is perfection. Absolute perfection. Who's the only perfect person who's ever lived on this earth? The Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only place that righteousness can come from from him. He's the only one who's ever lived a righteous life. The righteousness comes from him. So remember that. There will be no scales 
on judgment day. None at all. Saving faith, you see, is not faith in yourself. It's not faith in your goodness. It's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done, his doing and his dying, that he did it on your behalf, trusting him to save you from your sin, save you from the judgment to come because you trust him and all he has done for you. For only he can save you. For he is the only saviour God has ever provided. There is and will be no other. And so therefore today I point you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Look away from yourself and look to him because there is no other way anyone can ever be saved. What was our verse? The just or the righteous shall live. How? By faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to apply this two ways this evening. First, I want to talk about this in relation to initial saving faith. Then I want to talk about faith, this living by faith, in relation to our continuing to live by faith as believers. So first then, initial saving faith. Because we are all sinners by nature and sinners uh, in fact by our actions if we are ever to become true believers there must come a day where we like Martin Luther come to see that we have a desperate need of a saviour there must come a day when we hear and understand this glorious gospel of Christ for only in the gospel of Christ is there this righteousness revealed. No one can become a true believer unless they know about the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there must come a day when we personally respond to the gospel and in, in responding, I believe, we have to throw ourselves on God's mercy to save us by placing our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and all he has done for us. For as I suggested, there is no other way available. This is what I mean by initial saving faith. When Martin Luther understood that for the first time, he placed his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That was his initial saving faith, if you want. It's the time when we're transferred, if you like, from darkness to light, from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God. So I want to ask you this evening, can you point to such a day in your life? Can you think back? Has there ever been a time in your life when you've understood this? You've understood like Martin Luther that you are in desperate need of a saviour for unless you can have this righteousness there's no way God will ever accept you if you've felt the weight of that and the guilt of that that you know that there is absolutely no hope of you being accepted by God the way you are I wonder how many people have had that experience if you have and you know the Lord Jesus you will be rejoicing that you've understood it but maybe there are some here this evening who haven't understood this before. It might be all new to you. Well, here is the opportunity, folks. All right? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The opportunity is there for you even tonight. Remember, all this is possible only because of God's great love. Now we all know those verses, most of you I'm sure, of John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. However, we should always balance that with another verse 
In verse 36 it says this, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life and he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God abides on him. You see how serious it is. Once we understand these things, we have to make a choice. Am I going to believe or am I going to reject? That's where we're at tonight. That's where we're at. You see, Martin Luther came to this point and he understood it and he thought, how can I do anything else but accept? Here's the opportunity of a lifetime. This is something which will last for all eternity. I can do nothing else but throw myself on God's mercy and Lord, save me. And he did. He changed his life and many, many thousands and probably thousands and thousands from his preaching were also changed by this gospel of Christ. That's why the Apostle Paul could say again, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. So if there's any here this evening who have not yet come to this point of initial saving faith, I plead with you, call out to God to save you, for only he can do that. Nothing in all the world is more important than this for the just the righteous shall live by faith however there's a second way that I want to apply this truth this evening the just shall live by faith and that is to point out that true saving faith is more than initial faith it's more than just initial faith Now I know many people, many Christian people ask the question, how can I tell who the truly saved people are? Very difficult, isn't it? Sometimes I think we shouldn't ask, but it's very difficult to tell who the truly saved people are. Can I suggest to you a way that we can tell? Those who are truly saved are those who continue to live by faith. They've come to initial faith but they continue to live by faith for the rest of their life. That's what I'm talking about. They are people who trust God in every situation of life. They are prepared to obey God's word even if they can't see how things are going to work out. They live by faith in God not by and through their own sight. One example only, and that's Abraham, or Abram as he was in those days. By faith, Abram obeyed God when God called him from his home in Ur and commanded him to go to a country he did not know. And it says he went not knowing where he was going. If you like, this was initial faith. He heard God's command And he probably said in his mind, yes, I'll go. But you see, until he took that first step, he really hadn't obeyed, had he? He might have thought about it, but until he took that first step towards that land that God had promised, he really hadn't obeyed at all. You see, that was, if you like, the first step of his initial faith. But if you read Abraham's story, you'll find that he continued to live in that way. He continued to trust God step by step, event by event in his life. Now, some of you will know the story, and I'll just mention one part of it. Abraham was prepared, if necessary, even to obey God and offer up his only son Isaac on an altar in the way that God had commanded, even though he couldn't see how God could possibly fulfil the promise that he's made. How could God 
fulfill his promise and a whole nation come from him when this was his only son. So what was he going to do? Was he going to trust God and go ahead with what God said even though he couldn't possibly see how it could work out or was he going to reject? What did he do? He lived and exercised his faith, he trusted in God and he went ahead. And God remac... I can't think of the word. But God miraculously changed the events so that his son didn't have to die. But a ram died in his place. And some of you will know the story. All I'm trying to say is that Abraham began but then he continued to live a life of faith. He lived by faith and not just by sight. He trusted in what God had said in his word. However, it says in Romans 11, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. You see, God does test our faith to see whether it's genuine. Remember we said before that some people say they have faith? But God tests us sometimes to see whether our faith is genuine. Sometimes he sends sickness. Sometimes it's losing a job. All sorts of things happen in our life and some of us have been through these things. We know what it's like. God is testing our faith. Are we going to trust him even in these situations when we can't see the results? We don't know what's coming in front. Are we going to trust him? Are we going to be people who not only took that initial step of faith but now continue to live by faith uh, in our life? But God also gives us a command in his word as to how we are to obey him. Then he waits to see what our response will be. Right? God gives us commands in his word he, and he brings them to our attention and then he waits to see whether we're going to obey him or not. What's he doing? He's testing our faith. And, and, and when you, after you become a Christian, you start to grow in your Christian faith, you start to see things in the Bible that you hadn't seen before and God is saying, are you going to trust me here? Do you really believe me in these things? Are you going to act or not? And so God again is testing us. Will we obey him? Will we step out in faith or will we not? We might say we have faith, but are we prepared to show our faith by our continuing obedience? So again, can I ask you this evening, is there any circumstance in your life where you know what God's expressed will is, what his command is to you from his word, but to date you haven't been prepared to make that step of faith. You say you are a person of faith, but is that shown in your obedience, in your response to God's command? You see, it's often the case that doing nothing actually amounts to disobedience. Often we don't think about it that way, but that's what it is. I want to mention just two areas where people who are believers can come against this and have to decide which way they're going to go. The first one concerns believers' baptism. As you know, this is a public declaration of someone's genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, if you like, another one of those places where we, God challenges us to step out to demonstrate our faith in our actions. That's why he challenges every Christian. Are you going to be prepared to, to, to be baptised, to make that public declaration because I'm testing you? Is your faith just talk or is it action? God wants clear evidence that our faith is genuine. You see, Jesus doesn't want secret disciples. He wants those who are prepared to step out for him. Maybe there's some here that need to think about that this evening. I don't know you. The Lord does. The last one I want to mention, and this particularly re relates to young people, and that concerns relationships. Now I've noticed over the years, and I can remember I was a young person once, a long time ago, but with young people, relationships 
are almost everything. That's the most important thing in their life. But of course this is where the devil can get in, can't he? Particularly those, I'm talking about those who are Christian or indicate that they are believers. This whole issue of boyfriends and girlfriends becomes an immense issue for young people. And that raises a whole issue of being friends with the world, making close friends with people. Who should we make really close friends with and who shouldn't we? In James 4 it says this, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend with the world makes himself an enemy of God. You see, God's word is very clear. If we're going to live by faith, we have to trust God even in our relationships. Now, of course, ultimately these relationships are going to work out that we will ultimately get to a stage where we'll find someone that we want to marry. All right? Now, God has a plan for these things. But here, can I say, I have seen so many young people go astray. They make a profession of faith and yet when it comes to the issue of relationships, what happens? They profess to be a Christian but they meet someone who's not a Christian at all but they get caught up with them and they marry a non-Christian and there's trouble ever afterwards. What does the Bible say about that? Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness and what accord has Christ with Belial and what part is a believer with an unbeliever and what agreement has the temple of God with idols for you are the temple of a living God. You see this is part of living by faith, trusting God in relationships trusting God that he knows best. He's given us a direction in his word. Are we going to trust him or are we not? Do we know better than God? So I challenge you, young people, take God's word honestly, believe it and act on it. And there's some times where you have to make hard decisions. I know we have some young people in our church. They are at the crossroads, friends. We can see it. They have to make a very hard decision because once you get bound up with someone emotionally, it's very, very hard to break it off. And these young people have got to that situation and we're very concerned about them. And I've been around long enough to see that the devastating results that happen when this bond between someone who's a Christian and someone who isn't often, often, It goes on, the trouble goes on for generations and generations to come. Not just that generation. Because you cannot put light and darkness together. It doesn't work. There's going to be trouble in the future. So can I ask you, are you living by sight or are you trusting the living God? Are you living by faith in God and his word? Remember that scripture in Hebrews 11 verse 6 Without faith it is impossible to please God. This applies to both saving faith, initial saving faith and living by faith every day. So let's never forget those most famous words in this verse that we've been reading tonight. This verse that is God has used to change the lives of many thousands and thousands of people down through the centuries. This verse which God used to begin the great reformation which changed the course of world history. What was the verse? The just, the righteous shall live by faith. I trust that you are one who will live by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I trust that you...